Okay, so welcome back after lunch. Um, this is a project that has been led by Martin Olness, who's done most of the work. He's there smiling. I've made some contributions more recently. I'm not smiling. And at various points, we've had help from uh, Colin, David, Lawrence. They're all smiling. And uh, Fabio and Miklos, who are not smiling. Is there a distinction? Semantic? Well, PhD students. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the aim of this project was to um, generate kernels for non-affine meshes and to use a single implementation in both Phoenix and Firedrake. So a little bit of history here. So in late 2012, um, we got manifolds in Phoenix and we started talking about non-affine so we could get higher order meshes of the sphere. In uh, late 2013 and early 2014, we got these extruded or semi-structured meshes in Firedrake that uh, we, I spoke about last year. Around the same time, Martin came to Imperial and started to do some work on non-affine. At last year's Phoenix talk, Martin showed a demo, and I think it was just H1 Poisson, but on a higher order mesh. In around November, we got unstructured quads in Firedrake, and Miklos is going to talk about that next. And earlier this year, I went to Simula for a couple of weeks to try and finish off non-affine. So what have we done since last year? Well, we've got Piola elements working, we've got derivatives of Piola elements working, and this implies that we have nested derivatives working, and we also have mixed elements working, we think. And it came to my attention recently that we're not actually the first people to try doing non-affine in Phoenix. So uh, these guys spoke about it in 2010, and I don't know how many of these we got, they got, but I'm guessing not all of them. So I'm going to give this talk kind of backwards. So on another day, this could be my conclusion slide. So where are we at at the moment? Well, in Firedrake, uh, the code is currently not in master. It's just on branches. And I'll talk a bit more about why this is um, during the talk. All the existing Firedrake tests pass. And this is a big thing because um, we're, gonna, we're using a single code path, so we're passing even the old flat meshes through the same non-affine code path. Um, annoyingly, we can't yet use higher order meshes. This is due to some problems with UFL objects being immutable. However, the infrastructure definitely exists, and we've had success with um, quads, prisms, and we assume cubes. On the Phoenix side of things, um, there is a pull request open to UFL at the moment, so we use the same UFL changes in both Phoenix and Firedrake. There is um, no plans to add support for this through FFC. However, it should be supported through UFLAX, which is this new compiler Martin's working on and Marie spoke about this morning. And I don't quite know what the status with that is, but it really should require not too many extra changes. And I have no idea what the status is with Phoenix tests. So when do we need non-affine? Well, basically two situations. The first one is if, if you want a higher order representation of the mesh. And the second one is if you're not using simplex cells. So in Firedrake, we have these quads, and we have these semi-structured triangular prisms and cubes. And OK, what can we do in the existing code base? Well, technically, we can assign a higher order coordinate field to the mesh. I think that's true in Dolphin as well. I'm not entirely sure. However, we can't produce appropriate kernels. And in Firedrake only, for these non-simplex cells, we're currently using a so-called affine approximation just for compatibility, and I'll define that later on. So why do you want to use a higher order mesh representation? Well, if the domain that you're working on is just an approximation of the domain that you want to be working on, so this is like a flat panel approximation to a sphere, and here is a quadrilateral approximation, then this can limit your rate of convergence. And if you use this affine approximation with non-simplices, then this also hurts convergence 
particularly in mixed problems. So I'll just give a little demonstration of this. Um, my toy example, just to keep things simple, will be just a Helmholtz equation. I'll look at the two standard formulations. So one of them is the standard H1 formulation, and the other one is this mixed formulation where you introduce an extra variable, sigma. So if you look at the H1 formulation on triangles, then, um, so this is just normalized L2 error norm. Uh, mesh refinement level, every extra refinement is halving your mesh spacing. This is with just linear elements, and the dotted line is representing second order convergence. So, sure, with linear elements, you hit second order convergence on this sort of mesh. However, if you go up to quadratic or cubic elements, then because you still have this flat approximation to the sphere, you're still stuck at second order convergence. What about on quads? Well, this is the old code base using this affine approximation. Still, with first order or second order or third order elements, you're stuck at second order convergence. And if you get rid of this affine approximation, then, OK, your error decreases, but your convergence remains the same. So things are a bit different in the mixed formulation. So on triangles, things work as expected. So at lowest order, you just get first order convergence. And for higher order, you're limited to second order. But on quads with this affine approximation, so again, lowest order is going at first order. But the vector quantities represented by the triangles are also only going at first order with this affine approximation. However, get rid of this affine approximation using the, the new uh, non-affine functionality, and you recover second order. So the next few minutes are going to be like a very quick introduction through isoparametric. So for those of you who are familiar with this already, please do bear with me. Why do higher order and non-simplex meshes require different treatment, especially for code generation within Phoenix? Well, the geometric quantities, such as the Jacobian of the coordinate transformation, are no longer constant on each cell. And where do we use these quantities? Well, in UFL, we write integrals in physical space. So this is one of the blocks of the mixed Helmholtz system we saw before. And we need to convert this thing into integrals on the reference element. So to give a bit more detail, if we define J to be the Jacobian of this coordinate transformation, then there's basically four things. The integration measure picks up this factor of absolute value of debt J. The derivatives with respect to the physical coordinate become derivatives with respect to the reference coordinate by the chain rule. These fancy Piola map elements, um, their values themselves depend on the Jacobian. And if you have explicit geometry terms like the normal vector, then um, these also depend on the coordinates. So you start with this quite tame looking thing here, and it gets expanded out into this mess. And previously, the geometric quantities, so here just the Jacobian entries, they were calculated firstly directly from the vertex coordinates, secondly using manually handwritten code. This is in FFC code snippets.py and also in some of the header files in Dolphin and Firedrake. And thirdly, they were calculated outside the quadrature loop. And to support higher order or non-simplex meshes, this needs to change. So this requires a sort of intermediate step in thinking. And what you need to do is don't think about your mesh as having a bunch of vertices, and each of these vertices has a coordinate. Instead, just think of the coordinate field as being another function. So for example, the function x gives the x-coordinate of a point. And you can represent the function x in basically any finite element space, but not p0. If you're on a simplex mesh, then attaching the coordinates to the vertices is like storing the components in P1. 
a non-simplex mesh has the coordinate field in something like, say, Q1, so bilinears, while higher order meshes put the coordinates in some higher degree polynomial space. And putting the coordinates in P1 allows us to take a lot of shortcuts. So things like the Jacobian was constant over the cell. And another thing is, if you have some function of the Jacobian and you differentiate it in reference space, then this, previously, this function would just pass through the derivative. So these approximations are wrong if you're not on a simplex mesh. And previously, we used this affine approximation just for compatibility. And for this, we evaluated the Jacobian just at the midpoint of our cell. So what happens in the new implementation? Well, we make these UFL functions, and these UFL functions basically do these transformations. So they transform the integration measure, they transform the derivatives, and they transform the Piolimat elements, and also they transform things like um, the normal vector. And in FireDrake, we call these from FFC, and in the Phoenix implementation, these are called um, through UFLAX, Martin's form compiler. And a bit more detail, so in FFC, again, we've got the form compiler, so we can remove the code that applies the integration measure scaling. Why? Because we had the UFL functions that did it already. We can remove the code that applies the chain rule. Why? Because UFL did it already. We, re we remove the code that applies Piola mappings. And finally, we remove a thousand odd lines of manually written C code. Great. Just a little note here on mixed elements. So if some of the elements use Piola transforms, then we sort of build a matrix where the matrix maps from the reference mixed element to the physical mixed element. And if you're on a manifold, then this might have non-square blocks. So, OK, this implementation is correct, but there's a few problems. One of the problems is, what happens if you encounter the derivative of a Piola map quantity? So such as this div u we saw before, where this u is like an RT element. So this gets converted into something involving inverse Jacobian, d by dxj of some expression involving the Jacobian. And in order to get this form into sort of the form that FFC expects, we need to blow up all these derivatives again. So we need to pass this form back through the UFL differentiation functions and using the product and quotient rules, and this gets messy. And because these terms are expanded symbolically in, US in UFL, the form has now got way more complicated. And this isn't immediately a bad thing, because the UFL forms are not a tree. They're actually a... Um, directed acyclic, acyclic graph. So if you have common geometry sub-expressions, like an entry of the inverse Jacobian, then these all point to a single object in memory. However, so Uflex is smart here, and Uflex, Uflex makes a single intermediate variable from this. However, the FFC quadrata backend, which is used in FireDrake, unfortunately, just expands everything out. So... One consequence of this is that the form processing time goes up a lot. And in 3D, as soon as you have derivatives and Piola mapped elements, this can easily be 5 or 10 seconds. And another consequence of this is um, so some initial experiments I did with like, the most complicated code I had lying around, we got a factor 20 slowdown still using flat triangles. And why is this? Well, I dug into the, um, the kernel cache, and I looked at the kernel that was being generated, and there were these expressions, which were sort of 100,000 uh, characters of C in a single line. And, and GCC had just totally failed to optimize this, or well. Um, as a brief aside, we also tried running this through the Intel C compiler, and it produced good code, negligible slowdown, However, 
we sort of had to leave it overnight. <laughs> so in Firedrake, at least, the short-term workaround for this is to use um, this, opt this AST optimizer coffee, which Fabio spoke about last year. And this manages the common sub-expression elimination. So this is a really nasty workaround, because FFC has blown everything up, and then we're passing it into coffee, which we're relying on to shrink everything back down again. And OK, this is done. And as a longer term plan, we really hope to replace the FFC quadrant backend in Firedrake with um, something more sensible. So I'll spend the rest of this um, talk just saying a bit about performance. So recall that to ease the maintenance burden, it'd be quite nice if we could just use a single code path for both affine and non-affine meshes. So does this lead to any sort of slowdown? If so, how much? And on a non-affine mesh, such as a mesh of quadrilaterals, how big a price do we pay for doing things properly? So the test code I use for this is just some shallow water code. Um, it appears in the manifolds paper. And I'm going to do this on triangles and quads with elements between linear and quadratic. So on triangles, uh, the old code, so for a particular set of parameters, 51 seconds to assemble, 38 seconds to solve. With the new code, the 51 seconds went up to 60 seconds. So this is still on flat triangles, so this is a performance regression. However, the numbers should be exactly the same, so the solve remained at 38 seconds. And uh, this relied on some optimizations that we made to FFC. So Miklos made some changes so that FFC notices the Jacobian is constant and then hoists this calculation out of the loop. Also, because we had this problem of derivatives of Piola mapped elements, the code contains second derivatives of the coordinate field. But we're on flat triangles, so the second derivatives are zero. And we found some existing FFC optimizations that got rid of these. And afterwards, it went down from 60 seconds to 57 seconds. So we're paying about, at least in this example, about a 10% penalty from 51 to 57. So on quadrilaterals, um, the old code where we were making this affine approximation, about 52 seconds. With the new code where we're doing things properly, this goes up by about 60% to 83 seconds, although for some reason the solve gets slightly faster. And with this zero removal optimization, the assembly somehow goes up by a few seconds. I have no idea why. This talk isn't being, re is being recorded, so uh, I won't say that out loud. <laughs> and so I'll finish with kind of a list of things going through my head. And as much as I'm supposed to take questions, this is also sort of questions that I'd be interested to hear your answers for. So the first comment is there are at least three different, different implementations going on for non-affine meshes. So there's this short-term solution that I'm working on in Firedrake, which involves expanding things out in FFC and shrinking them back down in coffee. There is hopefully this medium-term solution where we replace FFC with UFLAX. And then in the longer term, I'm sure that we will eventually incorporate FINAT, which, did, which uh, Rob talked about yesterday. Um, some more practical points now. So these inverse Jacobian terms, on a non-affine mesh, these are generally a quotient of polynomials. They're not just polynomial. So you can't integrate them exactly. So what should we do with the quadrature degree? Should we leave it the same as we had it for an affine mesh? Should we increase it? Phoenix has um, generally, where possible, integrated things exactly. So if you have something like a mass matrix on a non-affine mesh, should you still try and integrate this exactly, or should you just use the same quadrature degree as affine? Is it acceptable to sort of throw this out to the users and have their assembly slowing down? Is it acceptable to throw this out to the users and have them taking 10 seconds or a minute in FFC? How do we visualize this higher order data? What does cell size mean? If you're not on a triangle and you're not on a tetrahedron, so in Phoenix, this is hard-coded to circumradius, should it really be something involving the determinant of the Jacobian? Should we be exposing reference measures 
and Jacobian entries to the user so that they can write sort of their own code. And is UFL the right place to put these transformations, or do they really live in the form compiler? So some questions for you guys, and I'm done. Thank you. Sure. So, um, so the question sort of ended up being, if you get rid of peelers, then does it make things simpler? Yeah. And um, so, two com so, so two comments. So first of all, okay, there might be some extra simplifications that you can make if you know that your, say, your coordinate field is the same degree as your function spaces. Yeah. Um, and yes, that is a simpler case. Yes, that is less likely to lead to these huge blowing up forms that take ages to compile and whatnot. Um, however, from the point of view of a developer, I sort of have to tackle the general case. So this is why, um, this is why I've been working on peelers and mixed elements. And also, we want to use these as a user. Other questions? Great. Yeah, I, I, I fully plan to do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So a few slides ago, I mentioned that uh, sort of we can't make we can't take advantage of these sort of identities, and like <laughs> that's the kind of thing that you could write out by hand, for example. So a little bit of background for those of you who kind of haven't got too involved in development. So one of the issues with UFL is that if you have a derivative like curl or div, then it sort of expands it out into components. And by then, you've, sort of, you've lost the information that you needed to make other simplifications. Any other questions? Thank you.